in Kosovo Crossing. David Fromkin describes events leading up to the war in Kosovo and about conflicting policy theories which affect the region. Mr. Fromkin spoke at the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs in New York City for about 55 minutes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Merrill House Programs, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to welcome our members, guests, and C-SPAN to our afternoon conversation with author David Fromkin, who will be discussing his book, Kosovo Crossing, American Ideals Meet Reality on the Balkan Battlefield. The recent war in Kosovo has been the subject of a remarkable number of studies. It has demonstrated how a seemingly insignificant place can have a profound impact on so much of the world. For Americans in particular, it has revealed the limits of American power to shape the world and has revived a discussion about what the nature of our role in ethnic conflicts should be and how we might want to think about these conflicts as they impact on our interests in the post-Cold War era. In his latest work, David Fromkin uses this battleground in the Balkans as a vehicle for his review of American foreign policy in the last half of the century. He places the strife between the Serbs and Albanians into historical context and seeks to explain the role that the Balkan War has played in the larger drama of American power abroad. David Fromkin is a lawyer by profession and graduated from law school at the age of 20. He is currently a professor of history and international relations at Boston University, having previously served as chairman of the Department of International Relations and director of its Center for International Relations. In the 60s, he served as a consultant to Vice President Hubert Humphrey and was head of foreign policy in Humphrey's presidential primary campaign. He is the author of six books in numerous articles and book reviews which have focused on global history and 20th century diplomacy. Among his books is a classic work on the Middle East, A Peace to End All Peace. He also wrote In the Time of the Americans and The Way of the World. He is a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Affairs. I know you'll want to join me in giving a very warm welcome to our author this afternoon, David Fromkin. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I'm going to speak only very briefly, uh, and then we'll ask your, your comments and, and questions. Finding a title for this book was a challenge because I wanted to suggest quite a number of things in just a few words. Kosovo Crossing is, is the title. Kosovo because it, the, the book deals with the essentials of the Kosovo crisis uh, of 1999 and provides the historical background going back to the Ottoman centuries of the Balkans and the redrawing of the Balkan map after the First World War. The book, however, attempts to place uh, Kosovo in its, in its context, in the context of Yugoslav, Balkan, European, and world politics, and essentially addresses the problems of the, of the aftermath of our military campaign uh, in, 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 um, in Kosovo. In many ways, Kosovo, the Kosovo episode, really is the occasion uh, for the uh, consideration of larger, larger issues. Um, Kosovo, Kosovo crossing. Crossing because I wanted to suggest a journey and a border or frontier. Because the expeditions that we have mounted to the former Yugoslavia uh, have been conducted in, in the Balkans, which, which is a frontier in space, where East meets West and Europe meets Asia. Uh, but this, um, our, our interventions uh, took place also across a frontier in time, uh, because from 1989 onward, as, as I argue and many people agree, uh, the United States found itself in a very special and different position in the world uh, than it ever had uh, before. 
the um, result is that, may, that questions that have been asked and answered long ago about American foreign policy have to be asked and answered and re-examined uh, again in the light of new circumstances to see whether they're still valid. Um, frontier in time. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, we have been in a most extraordinary position as a country. The United States is the greatest power in the world. I, I devote a, a chapter to examining the many facets of, of power uh, as you would set them forth in an international relations textbook and showing how in every way America is the most powerful. We're most more powerful than our country has ever been before or that any other country has ever been before. But perhaps even more to the point, there is no other equivalently powerful entity that balances us or that rivals us and that's a quite extraordinary uh, state of affairs. And on the surface of it, uh, you would think that that means that we're free to do anything we want and that we can accomplish anything that we want uh, in, in, in international relations. Um, and the puzzling thing is that it's turned out not to be true. We started our interventions in this new situation of ours uh, with the, in the Gulf War. And there was a great question at the time what we were attempting to do in that war. Uh, the administration uh, provided many different explanations. Um, you may remember that then Secretary of State Baker uh, said that the whole thing was American jobs, 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 an answer that made no sense at all. Uh, now, Ten years later, uh, we can see that what our objective was in Iraq was to remove Saddam Hussein, to destroy Iraq's arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, and to ensure that Iraq did not have the capability to recreate that arsenal. And we can also see that we didn't achieve those things. It's ten years later. Every now and again, we still bombard Iraq. We maintain an embargo, and uh, yes, we had some success, but we didn't accomplish our goals. Powerful though we are, certainly more powerful than Iraq. Or then again, there was Somalia. We went on in with a program of uh, wanting to provide food for the hungry, keep the starving from starving, ameliorating conditions in that country so that people could live some kind of a normal life. And after, um, uh, a local warlord had our, uh, several of our troops ambushed. We got right out. We, we didn't do it. We gave up. Um, in Bosnia, uh, we um, had as our objective the restoration of a, of a uh, society which was pluralistic and multicultured, lived in peace with one another, and we haven't done that, and certainly our, our aim, but uh, the best observers I know of, of that situation say that, the, uh, that what's happening there is a de facto partition of the country. But that's what we were against. Uh, and of course, now we've got Kosovo. Uh, we still don't know how it's all going to come out. But um, a lot of my friends, journalist friends who've been there and know the people involved, say that uh, it is um, almost certain that at some point Kosovo will become independent or will join with Albania. We're against that. Our goal is for uh, Kosovo to, to be part of Serbia. So here we are, one intervention after another in this era of what President Bush told us was going to be a new world order, enforced presumably by us. Um, here we find, ten years later, that um, something's wrong. With all of our power and nothing to counterbalance it, we're not achieving our objectives. And, and the question is, why is that? And uh, um, I hope you'll 
buy the book and find the answer. Um, because at, at, at the moment, I'm not, not uh, going to uh, uh, go, go into it other than to say that, that what I argue is that America now and even in the past has been unaware of the limitations uh, of, on, on, on our freedom of, of, of action in international affairs. Uh, even in, during the years of the Cold War, when, when we crafted this doctrine, the containment, the containment doctrine, which was a strategy and a policy that we followed, and we did indeed contain the Soviet bloc, uh, we seem to be unaware, certainly we didn't articulate it, that we ourselves were also being contained, and that important limitations were imposed upon us. By, by the Soviet bloc. The other thing I want to mention especially is that in the course uh, of my discussion, uh, I focus at, at, at one point on two completely contradictory doctrines, both of them very appealing, both of them propounded by Woodrow Wilson both of them embodied in the United Nations system and, and mutually incompatible. So you can only have one at the expense of the other. And, and those two doctrines are the integrity of existing states and frontiers, a doctrine that seems essential to keep the peace of the world, uh, a doctrine that seems essential if Wilson's goal is ever to be achieved of eliminating warfare. That doctrine on one side and the other is the doctrine of national self-determination, uh, which means the freedom to break, if it means anything, to break existing states and relationships apart. Uh, the relationship between those two doctrines is a fascinating one. Uh, I've provided some of the history uh, behind both of them. Uh, if I'm right in thinking that the one of the main political themes of the 21st century is going to be the tension between the falling apart and pulling together of states, then the contradiction between these two doctrines will continue to occupy a very major role in, in, in international affairs. The um, question that since I'm always asked, I will, I will, I will, I will answer in advance, is uh, how, how I evaluate the results so far of what we, um, what we did in, in Kosovo. What did we achieve? Some, some of you may have read an article, uh, I think it was in the last issue of Foreign Affairs uh, by, by Michael Mandelbaum. Uh, a, a brilliant scholar and a, and, and a friend of mine, who wrote an article claiming that the Kosovo expedition had been a, a failure, and indeed he termed it a perfect failure. And though I often um, agree with, with Michael on this one, I, 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 I don't entirely. Um, I regard the Kosovo thing up to date, assuming that we were to withdraw fairly soon and, 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 and no, no further things took place. Um, I regard it not as a perfect failure, but as an imperfect success. Uh, what, 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 Man, what Mandelbaum points out is that we didn't keep the initial mass murders from happening, and we didn't, weren't able to act fast enough to keep half the population of Kosovo from being forcibly expelled. Uh, and that's true. Uh, on the other hand, when once we did get there and intervene, we prevented tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people from being killed, and the other half of the population from being forcibly deported. So while there are things we didn't accomplish, there are very important things, worthwhile things, um, that, um, that we did. 
Uh, I, I, I myself am, am of the so-called realist persuasion in international relations. And I tend to believe that as a, a, a general rule, subject to exceptions, as a general rule, we ought not to intervene abroad militarily uh, unless some vital interest of America's is, is at stake, or at least a very important national interest uh, is at stake. So had I been president, it is very likely that I would have decided not to intervene. But, but we did. The administration was either very lucky or very skillful, uh, but I think on balance, up, up to date, the thing has worked. And so when, when, when I am asked what I think about it, you know, I'm, I'm sort of in the position of, of somebody, you know, if, if you have a friend who took everything they owned in the world and mortgaged their house and everything and took everything they had, went to Monte Carlo, put it on a number on the gaming table, and the number came up, what would you say? You did wrong? No, what you would say is it worked this time, but don't do it again. That is what I say about the Kosovo intervention. Thank you very much. You've given us a lot to open up a discussion with. And um, I'd like to ask that you identify yourself and um, please keep your question brief and to the point. Did I understand you well that our intention to Kosovo was Kosovo to stay with Yugoslavia and not to become independent or incorporated with Albania? Did you state that now? I say that the, the American intention is, is uh, as I understand it, is for Kosovo to remain within Serbia, within the Yugoslav uh, Federation, with, with some amount of autonomy and with protection for the Kosovars. What I then said was that what seems to be happening, what is likely to happen in the future, is not that, but instead either an independent Kosovo or one joined to Albania. That's what looks likely, I'm told, by, by, by what I think are the best informed people about it. Europe or this country, God, is really not that the goal was to keep Kosovo with Yugoslavia because they really were so partial of 40 Kosovars. They ignore completely the Serbian, the Yugoslav people. They almost destroy their country to protect the Kosovars. They are not really angels. And now you are telling me these people, they stated they want, they want to be independent or to go with Albania. They didn't deceive to us. We knew that from the beginning. So why we had a different goal? I mean, where this goal came from? One of the, in, in my book, I argue that one of the reasons for our failure to achieve our full goals in these various interventions is the incoherence of our policies and our aims. And I say that, that for us to intervene in this situation where both parties have des strong desires, the Kosovars for independence and, 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 and the Serb Serbian goals, we know that for us to intervene when what we want is what neither side wants, neither the Kosovars nor the Serbs want what we want, means that in the long term our goal will not be achieved. should have, before I raise my hand, thought through a number of things because I feel very strongly about this. Well, that's right. I'll, um, we didn't go in there to achieve autonomy for the Kosovars. We went in there as humanitarian intervention, hopefully to save lives. That was our main goal. There were, no na there were peripheral national interests because a stable Europe is national interest is within our national interest but our primary motivation was humanitarian and i think that's an extraordinary step in the development of humanity 
This has not happened before, and I think it's, it was quite a marvelous and noble goal. Mistakes were made. I think amazingly few, um, but this, this euphemism of collateral damage, there were, well, that's a, that's a different issue. But we didn't go in there with the intention of, okay, now we're going to go in and create a, an autonomous um, territory. We went in there to save lives. To make the comparison with Monte Carlo mm -hmm. is um, erroneous. I mean, you're impl implying that there was absolutely no thought, no skill, no talent whatsoever, that it was sheer luck which it wasn't. Well, um, if I, I certainly didn't intend to say that, uh, but let me start with, with the humanitarian aspect of, 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 of this matter. Uh, yes, it's important. That's why I said I disagree with Michael Mandelbaum. We did accomplish important things, and the important things were to keep murders from, from mass murder from going on and mass deportation from going on. I do not believe and here, here we may disagree. I do not believe that when you send in your armed forces, uh, there is such a thing as a purely humanitarian intervention. Once you intervene, whether you want to or not, you're in politics. Any intervention with armed forces, therefore, is a political intervention. The reason that, w that the United States has been in favor of autonomy for Kosovo is precisely to protect the people who live there. Otherwise, if we sent in our armies, saved them for the moment, and withdrew our armies, perhaps those people would be subject to being slaughtered again. So, so uh, what, what we did was, in my view, uh, in very large measure, uh, successful. And uh, yes, I think a great measure of skill went into it, and also, though, a great measure of luck. Uh, Raymond Knowles, it's a collateral to her question, and that is with CNN showing all these motion pictures in the evening of starving children and women escaping from just rape attacks or rape and all this, how do you keep from intervening in these kinds of situations that are going on all the time? I mean, that you say we shouldn't get involved. I say, how do you do it when the, the, the media, in effect, are bombarding the public with all these images that say there's a terrible thing going on here, we cannot let this go on unanswered? Well, that's a very good question question, and I'm not sure that I know the answer to it, but it, it, it does um, um, prompt me to say something else, that, that um, in, in many parts of the world, they saw different television things than we did. They saw American planes uh, bombing what some people said were civilian targets. Uh, they saw Americans doing, doing these things and uh, reacted very strongly against us. Um, I, I, I don't know how many of you were, were in Europe this summer, but, but uh, I found uh, in talking to people in quite a number of countries, an awful lot of people who thought not that we were the, doing this wonderful thing we were doing about coming in to save people, but that we were the brutes who were killing people. Uh, James Chase. Uh, to follow on, however, with that question, and addressing you perhaps as President Frompkin, since he pointed out that you would do things somewhat differently if you were, it follows on that other gentleman's question. First of all, um, when you discuss what you saw on CNN, the Europeans saw on CNN, that's later. The fact is that these interventions, Somalia, um, Kosovo, Bosnia, and most recently, which you haven't referred to as East Timor, are interventions which have largely been driven nonetheless, by domestic, by domestic constituencies in other countries than our own to do something about this, for humanitarian reasons, for a number of reasons, but largely for humanitarian reasons. And those pressures, it seems to me, are almost impossible to avoid, and they will continue, particularly among the democracies. Therefore, it would be very hard for you not to do what you, to say these are peripheral interests, which I agree, they aren't very important as interests, but I think it would be almost impossible for you to avoid intervening. And, and, and I guess related to that is, what, how, how indeed do you mobilize opinion for what, for example, I would consider, and probably you would as well, far more important interests, what may, uh, what may be happening in Colombia at the moment, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it's that Russia, I should say, at this moment. So how, how can you get across, as the president, the 
difference between primary and met what might be in places like Kosovo or East Timor, tertiary <laughs> interests at best. Okay, so those, those are two questions. Let me turn to the uh, U European one uh, first, where I think our perceptions are, are, are different, and it's, it, it's an interesting and, and uh, complex situation. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, a, large, a large number of the uh, leaders of a number of our allies in Europe uh, were indeed uh, very anxious uh, to intervene and for us to intervene and take the lead. That, that certainly was, was true. Not all of them, but, but lar in large part. Uh, on the other hand, the populations of those countries, uh, so far as I can tell, were of a different uh, disposition. Uh, so that even though, for example, Germany and Italy, in terms of leadership, were in favor of what we were doing, uh, both German and Italian leaders had to worry about uh, uh, the shakiness of their own domestic position if they even went along with it. So that I think that, that the European situation is, is perhaps more complex than, 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 than you suggest, and it would be harder uh, for me as president or for you as president to evaluate um, what, what, that, what, that, um, what that meant. Uh, as far as the other thing, as far as explaining to the American people uh, what our vital interests are and what they are not, uh, I believe that called for, calls for what is called leadership. And every four years, we're promised it. Richard Valcourt. Um, our allies in Europe uh, were involved uh, in this effort, but that also meant the utilization of NATO to implement it. Now, some have maintained that this was probably the wrong assignment for NATO, and it could uh, result perhaps in its downfall. So how do you factor in at this point the uh, NATO intervention in Kosovo? And two, you referred to the incoherence of the administration's foreign policy. Uh, they used a lot of words to try to explain what they were doing up and down the ladder. Uh, how do you define that incoherence, and what do you think leads to it? I'm not sure what, what, what leads to it. Um, I really don't. It, 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 it may be caused by, the, uh, by a number of people being involved in the making of foreign policy uh, with different views and different outlooks. Uh, certainly in this administration, well, we've been told all along that the president is not greatly interested in, in, in foreign affairs, so that uh, there are a number of his uh, 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 aides, associates, and and such, and, and as well as uh, Secretary Albright and 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 uh, Strobe Talbot involved. So, with with perhaps different different priorities. Um, um, uh, so, I mean, it's all all. I, I, and I'm I'm sorry. Could you repeat the first part of your question? The use of NATO. Was that well, the use of NATO. Of NATO, and if not, uh, what do you think will result? I, I think that we um, that we had to use NATO if we were going to act. Uh, only, NATO, uh, only by acting through NATO did we have the facilities available to us uh, for the instant transport of our forces and, uh, and so on. We, of course, we couldn't have, uh, it, going to the United Nations, obviously, I mean, would, would not, first, we, it would have been vetoed by Russia, so that would have been a meaningless gesture. But besides, only NATO actually has in being these military facilities. Whether it was wise to do that or not, I, I don't know, but we had already risked uh, NATO's credibility in Bosnia. We had therefore already raised the issue, and, and um, I think so we had, in using it, no, no, no option but to reestablish that credibility by, by, in fact, using it and using it effectively. No, when Hitler was... Oh, sorry. Mary Belknap, Foreign Policy Association. In the early 30s, uh, everybody in Europe knew that Hitler had uh, designs on other countries. And certainly in the end of 89 and 90, they were aware that Milosevic had the same idea. And Europe both times, one, was not prepared and not spending much money on armaments and really hoping it would go away. And when it finally didn't, of course, we got involved too. But 
I wonder if it wouldn't be better for us to encourage Europe to build up a, a, a force that would be able to handle things in Europe rather than sitting there waiting for us to finally come in. And well, I think one reason we don't go right away is we don't really think it's our problem. But uh, I just wonder if you think it'd be a good idea. Well, that, uh, it's an interesting uh, point that you make on, on the very day, as I recall, that um, Yugoslavia, in effect, surrendered. There was a, an, a front page article in the New York Times to the effect that leaders of our allies, of our NATO allies, uh, had, had met together uh, to share their common feeling that they were appalled at how far ahead militarily the United States was and that they couldn't afford to remain as far behind as they now saw themselves and that they should indeed start a program to build up their own military. And in response to that article, there was a, uh, a piece that appeared by uh, Henry Kissinger uh, saying that this was, this was real, that the Allies were indeed going to build up their own uh, as a result of what we had done, and that this pr might well mean the end of NATO and the end of the alliance because they'd throw off the shackles of American leadership, which would indeed appear as shackles. Um, and uh, that, according to Dr. Kissinger, is a great threat. I myself believe that it was all talk on the part of the Europeans. I don't think that they're going to appropriate the vast sums of money necessary to do this. Uh, I think they'll talk, talk, but not act. Uh, Lawrence Clark. Um, I'm seeking, searching my memory about uh, what was going on over there before this mess occurred. And uh, I can recall that in Albania that they had one of the cruelest despots and uh, uh, terrible things happened there. They were Albanians. And that as a result, something like 300,000 of them passed, passed the border into Kosovo. Uh, it seems to me that this war, or whatever it's called, was uh, instrumented. And uh, I, I refer particularly to June Perlez of the New York Times, that she had a long byline week after week, Mr. Lewis would probably remember, uh, with the same facts set forth set urging sympathy for the people who were being killed and forced to flee day after day after day and then uh, also most of the other media and, and the and the uh, people in Washington joined in I, I'm sorry what, what what is the question the question is it, it appears to have been instrumented our intervention the, the, the New York Times was among others, yes. I think you recall those articles, don't you? They are reporting what was going on. No, but it, it had the same inflammatory items. Hmm. Somehow I don't associate inflammatory with New York Times, but maybe that's me. Uh, Nick Rosopoulos. Uh, David, I want to push it a little bit on the three themes that you began your oral remarks with and which are indeed are the main uh, argument of the book itself. I agree with you completely, as you know, that there's no such thing as a humanitarian intervention that involves military force that does not become a political intervention as well, because otherwise it's a natural disaster and the International Red Cross can take care of it. But for, for it to be a political problem, there's a political question involved. And the political question sometimes involves thuggery on one side and long-time suffering from the other. And that raises the question of self-determination. And uh, in your little book, you seem to take sides against self-determination, except as a last resort sort of thing. Because more often than not, I read the book to say that it destroys peace and security and uh, it is better not to tinker with borders if at all possible and to respect sovereignty as traditionally understood but the question of who is suffering and what is 
the need for self-determination has to be seen from both sides, not just from us who don't want to be bothered, but from the people who are suffering. And indeed, the modern map of Europe, as you know better than I do, is the way it is today, because a lot of borders were changed and self-determination was allowed to take place, including in the Balkans. So I am a little disturbed by the seemingly cavalier attitude that you take as a self-proclaimed realist about the sanctity, the permanent sanctity of international borders and the desire to avoid allowing self-determination to take place. Uh, I also find the subsequent argument in your book about partitions and about forcible exchanges of population as being some kind of panacea, devoutly to be wished, because if only that take place, then the rest of us can not worry about things because the change takes place in such a way that it doesn't affect us, uh, callous to say the least, and not necessarily conducive to peace in the long run. If you take the self-determination argument or the argument against it to its logical extreme, this country would not exist today. It should still be part of the British Empire because we revolted against it and in so doing we upset the normalcy of the late 18th century of the international system. So I know what you are saying in general, but there are the exceptions in this instance about allowing for self-determination to take place when the cause is good enough and the need to preemptively allow for changes in sovereignty and in borders is sometimes so much more useful a way to proceed than to allow for the horrors to take place and then prescribe something as cruel as forcible uh, movement of millions of people in order for the international community not to have to worry about the problem anymore, that uh, it, it stops, as I say, being realistic. I think it becomes close to mindless. And the cost of a situation is one, the cost of a crisis in which by insisting, we, the United States government, that independence could never be admitted as a possible outcome of the crisis, that has been largely responsible for the facts that you describe in your book and your inability to tell us what you think the next phase of the crisis will be there. If we had been truly honest with ourselves and had said autonomy under a Serbian regime is cruel and unusual punishment for these people who have suffered enough for 70 years under Serbian control and that independence with certain protection for the other minorities is the much better way to proceed, I think we would not be in the straits that we're in today. And the, the question of a greater Albania emerging as a horrible threat to whose security, as you know, I've written about it before, uh, it, it is a silly argument. A greater Albania that includes Kosovo, you know, better that than what we have today. Yeah. Well, that, that raises a number of points. Let me begin with the thing about the United States. The prevailing doctrine, as I understand it, in public international law, supported by the United States, as well as by our historic practice, is to reconcile these two principles uh, by, uh, in, in the following formula, that the self right to self-determination applies in colonial situations but not in others. Uh, that is the, um, um, as I said, the, the, um, uh, the International Court of Justice seems to indicate that that is prevailing doctrine in international law. And it means that on the one hand, the United States was right in asserting its independence in 1776. And on the other hand, the United States was right in 1861 in refusing to the South the right to secede. Uh, whether or not you agree with that, 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 uh, that, what shall I say, American doctrine, uh, it is, it is a coherent one. It is one that we, that we support. And see, I, I, I don't say that uh, these are two very powerful doctrines and with both with very good reasons behind them. I don't say that, 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 um, 
there should never be, uh, that people should never have the right to self-determination, and it would be silly of me to say so. Uh, in fact, since borders and well, there's, I mean, there's so many things to be said about that. The 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 um, the the doctrine that that the borders and existing states should not be should not be changed uh, arose in Latin America in the 19th century under the under under the under the rubric uti posiditis, and the notion was that unless everybody just started from ground zero and said the colonial powers drew these frontiers, maybe their reasons were wrong, maybe everything about them is wrong, but if we start fighting about them, we'll have a bloodbath and we'll never have peace in this hemisphere. And so they adopted this rule, uti posiditis, which essentially, with some exceptions, has, has kept the peace there for a long time. The organization of African states in the 20th century s deliberately imitated that example. The political realities in Africa are tribal. Uh, if you wanted to have a really good system there, you'd have to draw it around the tribes. But if you let that uh, it once, once open up that question, and there will be a bloodbath in that continent. So the organization of African states was right, not inhuman, uh, but right I th to, to uphold such a doctrine. Woodrow Wilson uh, was operating on an assumption which perhaps you, you, will, you will not accept, many people now don't. Um, Woodrow Wilson came through the First World War saying, we can't afford to have another major war. There must be no more war. Now, I think that that's an unachievable goal in the kind of society we have. But given Wilson's goal, no more war, then you had to take a stand on this principle that you cannot, by force or threat of force, change an existing state uh, or, its, um, or its frontiers. One of the problems, as I see it, and, and, and I don't think you see that I see it as a problem, is how you reconcile these two very powerful principles in practice in a complex and changing world. Um, one of our problems is that we don't know the dimensions of the problem. I, in writing something else, not this, uh, some years ago, uh, I, uh, I, I, I saw a New York Times um, article with a headline, which, according to which there were somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 groups throughout the world who claim to be nations entitled to independence. And I used that figure. And then um, somebody called me, and, and, I, and, and I, I kicked myself ever since. For, it was, there was static on the phone. The person told me his name, and I couldn't hear it. I should have said, please tell me your name again. But anyway, he claimed he's a professor out in California, that this was his study. And where did I get that three to 5,000 figure? So I said, from the New York Times. And he said, well, that's interesting because my studies show that the true figure is more between five and 10,000. And so I've been using that figure ever since. But I mean, with, um, uh, I, I am now told that some studies have shown that on the contrary, if you're looking at plausible claims, really plausible claims, then you're only talking about maybe 40 or 50 groups. Well, if that's so, then we can deal because we've got 200 countries well, 250 doesn't change that so much. But if what we're facing is the possibility of 10,000 countries, then no matter how strong the moral arguments for your position, the world can't afford that. And we just, just, just can't, um, can't do it. Final point, one of the great questions, I haven't addressed it because I don't know the answer to it, but I hope I'll learn it someday. And, I, and if you get it before me, tell me. And it is this, why is it that nationalism, which in the 19th century was a unifying, enlarging force, bringing together Czechoslovakia, bringing together Yugoslavia, having brought together Italy and Germany, why is it in our time not a unifying, but a dividing force? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I try to understand um, why American, uh, Americans try to impose human rights in Kosovo. In other words, to defend civ uh, civil, uh, 
people who are running away from Kosovo, from Serbs, from bombs, etc., etc. On the other hand, they destroy Serbia in order to liberate Kosovo. By doing so, they create animosity with Russians. And you didn't touch the question how this thing reflects on the global history concerning Serbia, Kosovo, America, Russia, in that area. Would you address that, please? The, 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 um, the fear that what we were doing in Kosovo would alienate the Russians was a real one uh, and a serious one. Uh, while we don't know the, uh, but my, Michael Mandelbaum in the article I referred to said, mentioned that risk as one of the re one of the reasons for, in his view, this this thing being a failure. Uh, Strobe Talbot, uh, a deputy secretary of state, who is very keenly conscious of the Russian dimension uh, to problems in the world, seems to have patched things up with the Russians. I don't know whether, it, whether whether it's so or not, but for the for the moment, it looks like that that was done, and that this was part of the either skill or luck or combination that the administration has had. Because that certainly was um, when I said before, as as president, I would not have ordered this, uh, and perhaps I would have been wrong, but I wouldn't have done it. That's one of the risks I would have worried about. Um, as um, as for your other point, uh, which I think is well taken that that um, we had we had to destroy things and kill people in Serbia in order to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish in Kosovo. That's the problem with a military intervention. And it's, again, a reason why, were I president, I would be hesitant to order such interventions. Um, yes, it's in the interest of a higher good that we, that we send in our armed forces and cause casualties on the other side. Um, can we always be sure that we know what is the higher good? I asked the question. I don't know the answer. Roger Hurwitz. What should we have done in Iraq? What should we do? Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's a tough question. Uh, I think I would See, the, the administration, this administration and the previous one, the ba basic thing was that they wanted to keep Iraq together. Iraq, of course, had been created. It was an artificial state. Uh, it was created by the British in the 1920s by putting together three disparate provinces of the former Ottoman Empire. These are peoples who are quite separate from one another. And uh, one of the things our government wanted to do was make sure Iraq stayed together as a counterweight to Iran. And I understand they're wanting to do it. It was an intelligible policy uh, and so on. I think I would have taken, taken the chance and uh, uh, I would have gone further in the war. I wouldn't have stopped it or I did. I would have let Iraq, I think, split into three and taken the chances that uh, that, um, that would increase the danger from Iran. Uh, by doing so, I would also have, have achieved, I think, a, what shall I, a, 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 a something good for human rights and um, um, something good for Professor Rosopoulos's self-determination because the Kurds, uh, in, in, in such a case, would be allowed to have an independent state of their own, finally. Uh, I think that's... And that's, I mean, that's what I would have done then. I, it's, I suppose, I, I don't know, I don't know what, I honestly don't know what I, I do today. We, we have an embargo that causes the people to suffer but does not cause Saddam Hussein to, to suffer, and I, I don't, I don't know. Um, Delina Fitz, I'm uh, from the New School University. I have two questions. The first one um, has to do with um, uh, the history of conflicts before Kosovo. Um, the world, the international community, U.S. included, stood by in Rwanda when the genocide was happening. And then in Bosnia, it took like three years of destruction, rape, uh, mass killings, and all those uh, horrible things for uh, the Western, Western Europe and the U.S. to decide to come in. Do you think, like the uh, the awareness of these facts and, and of the 
uh, in, in, in inability of the international community to prevent uh, such horrendous things uh, play the role in making decisions uh, regarding intervention in Kosovo? This is my uh, first question. And the second one has to do with the UN. Uh, there was an, um, uh, an editorial in the New York Times, uh, I think one week ago, uh, about the role that the UN can play in, um, a, in settling um, armed conflicts, like interne I mean, in, in the world, versus regional um, uh, organizations that, in this case, would be NATO. What do you think about this? Do you think that the UN should be the one to go and uh, just settle the conflicts? And is the UN capable of doing this? And what, what's the role uh, that you see for regional organizations in, um, in uh, solving these um, conflicts? Okay, so your first question, um, yes, I do believe that uh, feelings of guilt uh, did play a role in our decision uh, to intervene in Kosovo, and not merely guilt for the episodes that you have mentioned. Uh, I I indeed, I, I, in, in, in my book, um, referring to the often, um, often, st often stated thesis that the Balkans are haunted by ghosts and that the, conflict, the conflicts there, the ethnic conflicts, are caused by ghosts, uh, by hauntings. Um, I, I said it was uh, the, the Western powers, inter the United States and its allies intervening were also acting because they were haunted, and they were haunted by, by memories of things they hadn't, they hadn't done anything about. The Armenian massacres, the Holocaust, uh, all sorts of mass murders in, in, in the 20th century. Uh, I, I think uh, many, many people liked, uh, many people, I think, indulged in the belief, possibly a fantasy, but in the belief that had they been alive then, they would not have allowed these terrible things to happen. And, and yes, I, I do think that that played a considerable role in, in, uh, for us, and maybe even more so for the Europeans uh, who wanted to go into Kosovo. Uh, I, I think that played a great role in that. Uh, uh, in that. Now, uh, second question, do we act through the United Nations or NATO? Uh, it's, um, it, it amounts to something simpler. Uh, it, it, the question is, is it a situation in which China and Russia uh, share our goals and will therefore act with us? If so, we can go to the United Nations. Uh, if not, uh, we have to go to another set of allies if we want to act in a multilateral way. Um, so it's, uh, it comes down in each, in each case, in each circumstance, to a question of w who we're in agreement with and who we're in disagreement with about what it is we want to accomplish. Right, thank you very much. The formal part of our um, program is over now, but I invite you to join us in um, reception. And Professor Frumkin will be autographing his book. I thank you for oh, okay. a very cogent, wonderful discussion. Thank you, thank you for being here. You can maybe move over here because the books are under here. Oh, uh, how do we? Oh, hi. David Fromkin chairs the International Relations Department at Boston University. He also contributes to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Affairs, and has written a number of books on international affairs. Kosovo Crossing is published by the Free Press, a division of Simon & Schuster. any other country has ever been before. But perhaps even more to the point, there is no other equivalently powerful entity that balances us or that rivals us. And that's a quite extraordinary uh, state of affairs. And on the surface of it, uh, you would think that that means that we're free to do anything we want and that we can accomplish anything that we want. Uh, in, in, in international relations. Um, and the puzzling thing is that it's turned out not to be true. We started our interventions in this new situation of ours uh, with the, in the Gulf War. And there was a great question at the time what we were, 
attempting to do in that war. Uh, the administration uh, provided many different explanations. Um, you may remember that then Secretary of State Baker uh, said that the whole thing was American jobs, 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 an answer that made no sense at all. Uh, now, uh, 10 years later, uh, we can see that what our objective was in Iraq was to remove Saddam Hussein, to destroy Iraq's arsenal of weapons of mass destruction, and to ensure that Iraq did not have the capability to recreate that arsenal. And we can also see that we didn't achieve those things. It's 10 years later. Every now and again, we still bombard Iraq. We maintain an embargo. And uh, yes, we had some success, but we didn't accomplish our goals. Powerful though we are. Certainly more powerful than Iraq. Or then again, there was Somalia. We went on in with a program of uh, wanting to provide food for the hungry, keep the starving from starving, ameliorating conditions in that country so that people could live some kind of a normal life. And after um, a, a local warlord had our, several of our troops ambushed, we got right out. We, we didn't do it. We gave up. Um, in Bosnia, uh, we um, had as our objective the restoration of a of a uh, society which was pluralistic and multicultured, lived in peace with one another. And we haven't done that, and certainly our, our aim, but uh, the best observers I know of, of that situation say that, the, uh, that what's happening there is a de facto partition of the country. But that's what we were against. Uh, and of course, now we've got Kosovo, and that seems essential if Wilson's goal is ever to be achieved of eliminating warfare. That doctrine on one side and the other is the doctrine of national self-determination, uh, which means the freedom to break, if it means anything, to break existing states and relationships apart. Uh, the relationship between those two doctrines is a fascinating one. Uh, I've provided some of the history uh, behind both of them. Uh, if I'm right in thinking that the one of the main political themes of the 21st century is going to be the tension between the falling apart and pulling together of states, then the contradiction between these two doctrines will continue to occupy a very major role in, in, in international affairs. The um, question that since I'm always asked, I will, I will, I will, I will answer in advance, is uh, how, how I evaluate the results so far of what we, um, what we did in, in Kosovo. What did we achieve? Some, some of you may have read an article, uh, I think it was in the last issue of Foreign Affairs uh, by, by Michael Mandelbaum. Uh, a, a brilliant scholar and a, and, and a friend of mine, who wrote an article claiming that the Kosovo expedition had been a, a failure, and indeed he termed it a perfect failure. And though I often um, agree with, with Michael on this one, I, 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 I don't entirely. Um, I regard the Kosovo thing up to date, assuming that we were to withdraw fairly soon and, 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 and no, no further things took place. Um, I regard it not as a perfect failure, but as an imperfect success. Uh, what, 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 Man, what Mandelbaum points out is that we didn't keep the initial mass murders from happening, and we didn't, weren't able to act fast enough to keep half the population of Kosovo from being forcibly expelled. Uh, and that's true. Uh, on the other hand, when once we did get there and intervene, we prevented tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people from being killed, and the other half of the population from being forcibly deported. So while there are things we didn't accomplish, 
that are very important things, worthwhile things, um, that um, that we did. Uh, In Kosovo Crossing, David Fromkin describes events leading up to the war in Kosovo and about conflicting policy theories which affect the region. Mr. Fromkin spoke at the Carnegie Council on Ethics and International Affairs in New York City for about 55 minutes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Merrill House Programs, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to welcome our members, guests, and C-SPAN to our afternoon conversation with author David Frumpkin, who will be discussing his book, Kosovo Crossing, American Ideals Meet Reality on the Balkan Battlefield. The recent war in Kosovo has been the subject of a remarkable number of studies. It has demonstrated how a seemingly insignificant place can have a profound impact on so much of the world. For Americans in particular, it has revealed the limits of American power to shape the world and has revived a discussion about what the nature of our role in ethnic conflicts should be and how we might want to think about these conflicts as they impact on our interests in the post-Cold War era. In his latest work, David Fromkin uses this battleground in the Balkans as a vehicle for his review of American foreign policy in the last half of the century. He places the strife between the Serbs and Albanians into historical context and seeks to explain the role that the Balkan War has played in the larger drama of American power abroad. David Fromkin is a lawyer by profession and graduated from law school at the age of 20. He is currently a professor of history and international relations at Boston University, having previously served as chairman of the Department of International Relations and director of its Center for International Relations. In the 60s, he served as a consultant to Vice President Hubert Humphrey and was head of foreign policy in Humphrey's presidential primary campaign. He is the author of six books in numerous articles and book reviews which have focused on global history and 20th century diplomacy. Among his books is a classic work on the Middle East, A Peace to End All Peace. He also wrote In the Time of the Americans and The Way of the World. He is a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Affairs. I know you'll want to join me in giving a very warm welcome to our author this afternoon, David Frumpkin. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I'm going to speak only very briefly, uh, and then we'll ask your, your comments and, and questions. Finding a title for this book was a challenge because I wanted to suggest quite a number of things in just a few words. Kosovo still don't know how it's all going to come out, but um, a lot of my friends, journalist friends who've been there and know the people involved, say that uh, it is um, almost certain that at some point Kosovo will become independent or will join with Albania. We're against that. Our goal is for uh, Kosovo to, to be part of Serbia. So here we are, one intervention after another in this era of what President Bush told us was going to be a new world order, enforced presumably by us. Um, here we find, 10 years later, that um, something's wrong. With all of our power and nothing to counterbalance it, we're not achieving our objectives. And, and the question is, why is that? And uh, um, I hope you'll buy the book and find the answer. Because um, at, at, at the moment, I'm not, not uh, going to uh, uh, go, go into it, other than to say that, that what I argue is that America now and even in the past, has been unaware of the limitations uh, of, on, on, on our freedom of, of, of action in international affairs. Uh, even in, during the years of the Cold War, when, when we crafted this doctrine, the containment, the containment doctrine, which was a strategy and a policy that we followed, and we did indeed contain 
the Soviet bloc. Uh, we seem to be unaware, certainly we didn't articulate it, that we ourselves were also being contained and that important limitations were imposed upon us by, by the Soviet bloc. The other thing I want to mention especially is that in the course uh, of my discussion, uh, I focus at, uh, at one point on two completely contradictory doctrines, both of them very appealing, both of them propounded by Woodrow Wilson, both of them embodied in the United Nations system, and, and mutually incompatible. So you can only have one at the expense of the other. And, and those two doctrines are the integrity of existing states and frontiers, a doctrine that seems essential to keep the peace of the world, uh, a doctrine. Kosovo crossing is, is the title. Kosovo, because it, the, the book deals with the essentials of the Kosovo crisis uh, of 1999 and provides the historical background going back to the Ottoman centuries of the Balkans and the redrawing of the Balkan map after the First World War. The book, however, attempts to place uh, Kosovo in its, in its context, in the context of Yugoslav, Balkan, European, and world politics, and essentially addresses the problems of the, of the aftermath of our military campaign uh, in, 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 um, in Kosovo. In many ways, Kosovo, the Kosovo episode, really is the occasion uh, for the uh, consideration of larger, larger issues. Um, Kosovo, Kosovo crossing. Crossing because I wanted to suggest a journey and a border or frontier. Because the expeditions that we have mounted to the former Yugoslavia, uh, have been conducted in, in the Balkans, which, which is a frontier in space, where East meets West and Europe meets Asia. Uh, but this, um, our, our interventions uh, took place also across a frontier in time, uh, because from 1989 onward, as, as I argue and many people agree, uh, the United States found itself in a very special and different position in the world uh, than it ever had uh, before. The um, result is that, may, that questions that have been asked and answered long ago about American foreign policy have to be asked and answered and re-examined uh, again, in the light of new circumstances, to see whether they're still valid. Um, frontier in time. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, we have been in a most extraordinary position as a country. The United States is the greatest power in the world. I, I devote a, a chapter to examining the many facets of, of power uh, as you would set them forth in an international relations textbook, and showing how in every way America is the most powerful. We're most more powerful than our country has ever been before, or that 